The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durand. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. To this light-hearted relish for robbery and slaughter, the Achaeans add an unabashed mendacity. Odysseus can hardly speak without lying or act without treachery. Having captured the Trojan scout Dolan, he and Diomed promise him life if he will give them the information they require. He does, and they kill him. It is true that the other Achaeans do not quite equal Odysseus in dishonesty, but not because they would not. They envy and admire him and look up to him as a model character. The poet who pictures him considers him a hero in every respect. Even the goddess Athena praises him for his lying and counts this among the special charms for which she loves him. Cunning must he be and knavish, she tells him, smiling and stroking him with her hand, who would go beyond thee in all manner of guile, I, though it were a god that met thee. Bold man, crafty in counsel, insatiate in deceit, not even in thine own land, it seems, wast thou to cease from guile and deceitful tales, which thou lovest from the bottom of thine heart. In truth, we ourselves are drawn to this heroic Munchausen of the ancient world. We discover some likable traits in him, and in the hardy and subtle people to which he belongs. He is a gentle father, and in his own kingdom a just ruler, who wrought no wrong in deed or word to any man in the land. Never again, says his swineherd, shall I find a master so kind, how far soever I go, not though I come again to the house of my father and mother. We envy Odysseus his form like unto the immortals, his frame so athletic that though nearing fifty, he throws the disc farther than any of the Phaeacian youths. We admire his steadfast heart, his wisdom like to Jove's, and our sympathy goes out to him when, in his despair of ever seeing again the smoke leaping up from his own land, he yearns to die or when, in the midst of his perils and sufferings, he steals himself with words that old Socrates loved to quote. Be patient now, my soul, thou hast endured still worse than this. He is a man of iron in body and mind, and yet every inch human, and therefore forgivable. The secret of the matter is that the Achaeans' standard of judgment is as different from ours as the virtues of war differ from those of peace. He lives in a disordered, harassed, hungry world, where every man must be his own policeman, ready with arrow and spear, and a capacity for looking calmly at flowing blood. A ravening belly, as Odysseus explains, no man can hide. Because of it are the benched ships made ready that bear evil to foemen over the unresting sea. Since the Achaean knows little security at home, he respects none abroad. Every weakling is fair play. The supreme virtue in his view is a brave and ruthless intelligence. Virtue is literally virtus, manliness, arete, the quality of Ares or Mars. The good man is not one that is gentle and forbearing, faithful and sober, industrious and honest. He is simply one who fights bravely and well. A bad man is not one that drinks too much, lies, murders, and betrays. He is one that is cowardly, stupid, or weak. There were Nietzscheans long before Nietzsche, long before Thrasymachus, in the lusty immaturity of the European world. 3. Sexes Achaean society is a patriarchal despotism tempered with the beauty and anger of woman and the fierce tenderness of parental love. Theoretically, the father is supreme. He may take as many concubines as he likes. He may offer them to his guests. He may expose his children on the mountaintops to die or slaughter them on the altars of the thirsty gods. Such paternal omnipotence does not necessarily imply a brutal society, but only one in which the organization of the state has not yet gone far enough to preserve social order and in which the family, to create such order, needs the powers that will later be appropriated by the state in a nationalization of the right to kill. As social organization advances, paternal authority and family unity decrease, freedom and individualism grow. In practice, the Achaean male is usually reasonable, listens patiently to domestic eloquence, and is devoted to his children. Within the patriarchal framework, the position of woman is far higher in Homeric than it will be in Periclean Greece. In the legends and the epics, she plays a leading role, from Pelops's courtship of Hippodamia to Iphigenia's gentleness and Electra's hate. The Gynoseum does not confine her, nor does the home. She moves freely among men and women alike, and occasionally shares in the serious discourse of the men, as Helen does with Menelaus and Telemachus. When the Achaean leaders wish to fire the imagination of their people against Troy, they appeal not to political or racial or religious ideas, but to the sentiment for woman's beauty. The loveliness of Helen must put a pretty face upon a war for land and trade. 
Without woman, the Homeric hero would be a clumsy boar with nothing to live for or die for. She teaches him something of courtesy, idealism, and softer ways. Marriage is by purchase, usually an oxen or their equivalent, paid by the suitor to the father of the girl. The poet speaks of cattle-bringing maidens. The purchase is reciprocal, for the father usually gives the bride a substantial dowry. The ceremony is familial and religious, with much eating, dancing, and loose-tongued merriment. Beneath a blaze of torches they led the brides from their chambers through the city, and loud rose the bridal song. The young men whirled in the dance, and high among them did sound the flute and the lyre. So changeless are the essentials of our life. Once married, the woman becomes mistress in her home, and is honored in proportion to her children. Love, in the truest sense, as a profound mutual tenderness and solicitude, comes to the Greeks as to the French after marriage rather than before. It is not the spark thrown off by the contact or nearness of two bodies, but the fruit of long association in the cares and industries of the home. The Homeric wife is as faithful as her husband is not. There are three adulteresses in Homer, Clytemnestra, Helen, and Aphrodite, but they do injustice to the mortal average, if not to the divine. Formed out of this background, the Homeric family, barring the enormities of legends that play no part in Homer, is a wholesome and pleasing institution, rich in fine women and loyal children. The women function not only as mothers but as workers. They grind the grain, card the wool, spin, weave, and embroider. They do little sewing since garments are mostly without seams, and cooking is normally left to men. Amid these labors they bear and rear children, heal their hurts, pacify their quarrels, and teach them the manners, morals, and traditions of the tribe. There is no formal education, apparently no teaching of letters, no spelling, no grammar, no books. It is a boy's utopia. The girl is taught the arts of the home, the boy those of the chase and war. He learns to fish and swim, to till the fields, set snares, handle animals, aim the arrow and the lance, and take care of himself in all the emergencies of a half-lawless life. When the oldest boy grows up to manhood, he becomes, in the absence of his father, the responsible head of the family. When he marries, he brings his bride to his father's home, and the rhythm of the generations is renewed. The individual members of the family change with time, but the family is the lasting unit, surviving perhaps for centuries, and forging in the turbulent crucible of the home the order and character without which all government is in vain. 4. The Arts The Achaeans leave to merchants and lowly scribes the art of writing, which has presumably been handed down to them from Mycenaean Greece. They prefer blood to ink and flesh to clay. In all of Homer there is but one reference to writing, and there in a characteristic context. A folded tablet is given to a messenger, directing the recipient to kill the messenger. If the Achaeans have time for literature, it is only when war and marauding allow a peaceful interlude. The king or prince gathers his retainers about him for a feast, and some wandering minstrel, stringing the lyre, recounts in simple verse the exploits of ancestral heroes. This is for the Achaeans both poetry and history. Homer, perhaps wishing like Phidias to engrave his own portrait upon his work, tells how Alcinous, king of the Phaeacians, calls for such song in entertaining Odysseus. Summon hither the divine minstrel, Demodocus, for to him above all others has the god granted skill in song. Then the herald drew near, leading the good minstrel, whom the muse loved above all other men, and gave him both good and evil. Of his sight she deprived him, but gave him the gift of sweet song. The only art except his own that interests Homer is terutics, the hammering of metals into plastic forms. He says nothing of painting or sculpture, but calls up all his inspiration to describe the scenes inlaid or damascened upon Achilles' shield, or raised in relief upon Odysseus's brooch. He speaks briefly but illuminatingly about architecture. The common dwelling in Homer is apparently of sun-dried brick with a footing of stone. The floor is ordinarily of beaten earth and is cleaned by scraping. The roof is of reeds overlaid with clay and slopes only enough to carry off the rain. The doors are single or double and may have bolts or keys. In the better dwellings the interior walls are of painted stucco with ornamental border or frieze, and are hung with weapons, shields, and tapestries. There is no kitchen, no chimney, no windows. An opening in the roof of the central hall lets out some of the smoke that may rise from the hearth. The rest finds its way through the door, or settles in soot on the walls. Rich establishments have a bathroom. Others content themselves with a tub. The furniture is of heavy wood, often artistically carved and finished. Icmalius fashions for Penelope an armchair set with ivory and precious metals, and Odysseus makes for himself and his wife a massive bedstead, 
designed to last for a century. It is characteristic of the age that its architecture ignores temples and spends itself upon palaces, just as Periclean architecture will neglect palaces and lavish itself upon temples. We hear of the sumptuous home of Paris, which that prince had built with the aid of the most cunning architects in Troy, of King Alcinous's great mansion, with walls of bronze, frieze of blue glass paste, doors of silver and gold, and other features that may belong rather to poetry than to architecture. We hear something of Agamemnon's royal residence at Mycenae, and a great deal about Odysseus's palace at Ithaca. This has a front court paved in part with stone, surrounded by a palisade or plastered wall, and adorned with trees, stalls for horses, and a heap of steaming dung on which Odysseus's dog Argos makes his bed in the sun. A large pillared porch leads to the house. Here the slaves sleep and often the visitors. Within, an anteroom opens upon a central hall supported by pillars, and sometimes lighted not only by the opening in the roof, but by a narrow clerestory or open space between the architrave and the eaves. At night, braziers burn on tall stands, giving an unsteady illumination. In the center of the hall is the hearth, around whose sacred fire the family gathers in the evening for warmth and good cheer, and debates the ways of neighbors, the willfulness of children, and the vicissitudes of states. 5. The State How are these passionate and vigorous Achaeans ruled? In peace by the family, in crisis by the clan. The clan is a group, genos, literally a genus, of persons acknowledging a common ancestor and a common chieftain. The citadel of the chieftain is the origin and center of the city. Here, as his force subsides into usage and law, clan after clan gathers and makes a political as well as a kinship community. When the chieftain desires some united action from his clan or city, he summons its free males to a public assembly and submits to them a proposal which they may accept or reject, but which only the most important members of the group may propose to change. In this village assembly, the one democratic element in an essentially feudal and aristocratic society, skilled speakers who can sway the people are valuable to the state. Already an old Nestor, whose voice flows sweeter than honey from his tongue, and in wily Odysseus, whose words fall like snowflakes upon the people, we have the beginnings of that stream of eloquence which will reach greater heights in Greece than in any other civilization, and will finally submerge it in ruin. When all the clans must act at once, the chieftains follow the lead of the strongest of their number as king, and report to him with their armies of freemen and attendant slaves. Those chieftains who are nearest to the king in residence and respect are called the king's companions. They will be called that again in Philip's Macedonia and in Alexander's camp. In their boule, or council, the nobles exercise full freedom of speech, and address the king as merely and temporarily first among equals. Out of these institutions, public assembly, council of nobles, and king, will come in a hundred varieties and under a thousand shibboleths and phrases, the constitutions of the modern Western world. The powers of the king are narrowly limited and very wide. They are limited in space, for his kingdom is small. They are limited in time, for he may be deposed by the council, or by a right which the Achaeans readily recognize, the right of the stronger. Otherwise his rule is hereditary, and has only the vaguest boundaries. He is above all a military commander, solicitous for his army, without which he might be found in the wrong. He sees to it that it is well equipped, well fed, well trained, that it has poisoned arrows, lances, helmets, greaves, spears, breastplates, shields, and chariots. So long as the army defends him, he is the government, legislature, executive, judiciary. He is the high priest of the state religion and sacrifices for the people. His decrees are the laws, and his decisions are final. There is as yet no word for law. Below him the council may sit occasionally to judge grave disputes. Then, as if to set a precedent for all courts, it asks for precedents and decides accordingly. Precedent dominates law because precedent is custom, and custom is the jealous older brother of law. Trials of any kind, however, are rare in Homeric society. There are hardly any public agencies of justice. Each family must defend and revenge itself. Violence abounds. To support his establishment, the king does not levy taxes. He receives now and then gifts from his subjects. But he would be a poor king if he depended upon such presents. His chief income is derived, presumably, from tolls on the plunder that his soldiers and his ships gather on land or sea. Perhaps that is why, late in the 13th century, the Achaeans are found in Egypt and Crete, in Egypt as unsuccessful buccaneers, in Crete as passing conquerors. Then, suddenly, we hear of them inflaming their people with the tale of humiliating rape, collecting all the forces of all the tribes, equipping a hundred thousand men, and sailing in a vast and unparalleled armada of a thousand ships to try their fortunes against the spearhead of Asia on the plains and hill of Troy. 
Four, the siege of Troy. Was there such a siege? We only know that every Greek historian and every Greek poet and almost every temple record or legend in Greece took it for granted. That archaeology has placed the ruined city generously multiplied before our eyes, and that today, as until the last century, the story and its heroes are accepted as, in essence, real. An Egyptian inscription of Ramesses the Third reports that the Isles were restless toward 1196 B.C., and Pliny alludes to a Ramesses in whose time Troy fell. The great Alexandrian scholar Eratosthenes. On the basis of traditional genealogies collated late in the sixth century before Christ by the geographer historian Hecateus, calculated the date of the siege as 1194 B.C. The ancient Persians and Phoenicians agreed with the Greeks in tracing the Great War to four abductions of beautiful women. The Egyptians, they said, stole Io from Argos. The Greeks stole Europa from Phoenicia and Medea from Colchis. Did not a just balancing of the scales require that Paris should abduct Helen? Stesichorus, in his penitent years, and after him Herodotus and Euripides, refused to admit that Helen had gone to Troy. She had only gone to Egypt under constraint, and had merely waited there a dozen years for Menelaus to come and find her. Besides, asked Herodotus, who could believe that the Trojans would fight ten years for one woman? Euripides attributed the expedition to excess population in Greece. And the consequent urge to expansion, so old are the youngest excuses of the will to power. Nevertheless, it is possible that some such story was used to make the adventure digestible for the common Greek. Men must have phrases if they are to give their lives. Whatever may have been the face and the shibboleth of the war, its cause and essence lay, almost beyond doubt, in the struggle of two groups of powers for possession of the Hellespont and the rich lands lying about the Black Sea. All Greece and all Western Asia saw it as a decisive conflict. The little nations of Greece came to the aid of Agamemnon, and the peoples of Asia Minor sent repeated reinforcements to Troy. It was the beginning of a struggle that would be renewed at Marathon and Salamis, at Issus and Arbela, at Tours and Granada, at Lepanto and Vienna. Of the events and aftermath of the war, we can relate only what the poets and dramatists of Greece have told us. We accept this as rather literature than history. But all the more, for that reason, a part of the story of civilization. We know that war is ugly, and that the Iliad is beautiful. Art, to vary Aristotle, may make even terror beautiful, and so purify it by giving it significance and form. Not that the form of the Iliad is perfect; the structure is loose; the narrative is sometimes contradictory or obscure; the conclusion does not conclude. Nevertheless, the perfection of the parts atones for the disorder of the whole, and with all its minor faults, the story becomes one of the great dramas of literature, perhaps of history. In the first book, at the opening of the poem, the Greeks have already besieged Troy for nine years in vain. They are despondent, homesick, and decimated with disease. They had been delayed at Aulis by sickness and a windless sea, and Agamemnon had embittered Clytemnestra and prepared his own fate. By sacrificing their daughter Iphigenia for a breeze, on the way up the coast, the Greeks had stopped here and there to replenish their supplies of food and concubines. Agamemnon had taken the fair Chryseis, Achilles the fair Briseis. A soothsayer now declares that Apollo is withholding success from the Greeks because Agamemnon has violated the daughter of Apollo's priest, Chryseis. The king restores Chryseis to her father, but to console himself and point a tale. He compels Briseis to leave Achilles and take Chryseis's place in the royal tent. Achilles convokes a general assembly and denounces Agamemnon with a wrath that provides the first word and the recurring theme of the Iliad. He vows that neither he nor his soldiers will any longer stir a hand to help the Greeks. In the second book, we pass in review the ships and tribes of the assembled force, and in the third. We see bluff Menelaus engaging Paris in single combat to decide the war. The two armies sit down in civilized truce. Priam joins Agamemnon in solemn sacrifice to the gods. Menelaus overcomes Paris, but Aphrodite snatches the lad safely away in a cloud and deposits him, miraculously powdered and perfumed, upon his marriage bed. Helen bids him return to the fight, but he counterproposes that they give the hour to dalliance. The lady, flattered by desire, yields. In Book Four, Agamemnon declares Menelaus victor, and the war is apparently ended. But the gods, in imitative counsel on Olympus, demand more blood. Zeus votes for peace, but withdraws his vote in terrified retreat when Hera, his spouse, directs her speech upon him. 
She suggests that if Zeus will agree to the destruction of Troy, she will allow him to raise Mycenae, Argos, and Sparta to the ground. The war is renewed. Many a man falls pierced by arrow, lance, or sword, and darkness enfolds his eyes. In Book 5, the gods join in the merry slicing game. Ares, the awful god of war, is hurt by Diomed's spear, utters a cry as of nine thousand men, and runs off to complain to Zeus. In Book 6, in a pretty interlude, the Trojan leader Hector, before rejoining the battle, bids goodbye to his wife Andromache. Love, she whispers to him, thy stout heart will be thy death, nor hast thou pity of thy child or me who shall soon be a widow. My father and my mother and my brothers all are slain, but Hector, thou art father to me and mother, and thou art the husband of my youth. Have pity then, and stay here in the tower. Full well I know, he answers, that Troy will fall, and I foresee the sorrow of my brethren and the king. For them I grieve not, but to think of thee a slave in Argos unmans me almost. Yet even so I will not shirk the fight. His infant son Astyanax, destined shortly to be flung over the walls to death by the victorious Greeks, screams in fright at Hector's waving plumes, and the hero removes his helmet that he may laugh, weep, and pray over the wandering child. Then he strides down the causeway to the battle, and, in Book 7, engages Ajax, king of Salamis, in single combat. They fight bravely, and separate at nightfall with exchange of praise and gifts, a flower of courtesy floating on a sea of blood. In Book 8, after a day of Trojan victories, Hector bids his warriors rest. Thus made harangue to them Hector, and roaring the Trojans applauded. Then from the yoke loosed their war steeds sweating, and each by his chariot tethered his horses with thongs. And then they brought from the city hastily oxen and goodly sheep, and wine honey-hearted gave them, and corn from the houses. Firewood they gathered with all. And then from the plain to the heavens rose on the winds the sweet savor. And these by the highways of battle hopeful sat through the night, and many their watchfires burning. Even as when in the sky the stars shine out round the night orb, wondrous to see, and the winds are laid, and the peaks and the headlands tower to the view, and the glades come out, and the glorious heaven stretches itself to its widest, and sparkle the stars multitudinous, gladdening the heart of the toil-wearied shepherd. Even as countless twixt the black ships and the river of Xanthus glittered the watchfires built by the horse-taming Trojans by Ilium. Meanwhile the war-wearied horses, champing, spelt, and white barley, close by their chariots, waited the coming of fair-throned dawn. In Book 9, Nestor, king of Elian Pylos, advises Agamemnon to restore Briseis to Achilles. He agrees and promises Achilles half of Greece if he will rejoin the siege. But Achilles continues to pout. In Book 10, Odysseus and Diomed make a two-man sally upon the Trojan camp at night and slay a dozen chieftains. In Book 11, Agamemnon leads his army valiantly, is wounded, and retires. Odysseus, surrounded, fights like a lion. Ajax and Menelaus cleave a path to him and save him for a bitter life. In books 12 through 14, when the Trojans advance to the walls that the Greeks have built about their camp, Hera is so disturbed that she resolves to rescue the Greeks. Oiled, perfumed, ravishingly gowned, and bound with Aphrodite's aphrodisiac girdle, she seduces Zeus to a divine slumber, while Poseidon helps the Greeks to drive the Trojans back. In book 15, advantage fluctuates, the Trojans reach the Greek ships, and the poet rises to a height of fervid narrative as the Greeks fight desperately in a retreat that must mean death. In Book 16, Patroclus, beloved of Achilles, wins his permission to lead Achilles' troops against Troy. Hector slays him, and in Book 17, fights Ajax fiercely over the body of the youth. In Book 18, hearing of Patroclus' death, Achilles at last resolves to fight. His goddess mother Thetis persuades the divine smithy, Hephaestus, to forge for him new arms and a mighty shield. In Book 19, Achilles is reconciled with Agamemnon. In 20, engages Aeneas and is about to kill him when Poseidon rescues him for Virgil's purposes. In Book 21, Achilles slaughters a host of Trojans and sends them to Hades with long genealogical speeches. The gods take up the fight. Athena lays Ares low with a stone, and when Aphrodite, going for a soldier, tries to save him, Athena knocks her down with a blow upon her fair breast. Hera cuffs the ears of Artemis. Poseidon and Apollo content themselves with words. In Book 22, all Trojans but Hector fly from Achilles. Priam and Hecuba counsel Hector to stay behind the walls, but he refuses. Then suddenly, as Achilles advances upon him, Hector takes to his heels. Achilles pursues him three times around the walls of Troy. Hector makes a stand, 
and is killed. In Book 23, in the subsiding finale of the drama, Patroclus is cremated with ornate ritual. Achilles sacrifices to him many cattle, twelve captured Trojans, and his own long hair. The Greeks honor Patroclus with games, and in Book 24, Achilles drags the corpse of Hector behind his chariot three times around the pyre. Priam comes in state and sorrow to beg for the remains of his son. Achilles relents, grants a truce of twelve days, and allows the aged king to take the cleansed and anointed body back to Troy. 5. Here the great poem suddenly ends, as if the poet had used up his share of a common story and must leave the rest to another minstrel's lay. We are told by the later literature how Paris, standing beside the battle, slew Achilles with an arrow that pierced his vulnerable heel, and how Troy fell at last through the stratagem of the wooden horse. The victors themselves were vanquished by their victory and returned in weary sadness to their longed-for homes. Many of them were shipwrecked, and some of these, stranded on alien shores, founded Greek colonies in Asia, the Aegean, and Italy. Menelaus, who had vowed that he would kill Helen, fell in love with her anew when the goddess among women came to him in the calm majesty of her loveliness. Gladly he took her back to be his queen again in Sparta. When Agamemnon reached Mycenae, he clasped his land and kissed it, and many were the hot tears that streamed from his eyes. But during his long absence, Clytemnestra had taken his cousin Aegisthus for husband and king, and when Agamemnon entered the palace, they slew him. Sadder still was the homecoming of Odysseus, and here probably another Homer has told the tale in a poem less powerful and heroic, gentler and pleasanter than the Iliad. Very probably the narrative in this instance has less basis in history than the Iliad. The legend of the long-wandering mariner or warrior whose wife cannot recognize him on his return, is apparently older than the story of Troy, and appears in almost every literature. Odysseus is the Sinue, the Sinbad, the Robinson Crusoe, the Enoch Arden of the Greeks. The geography of the poem is a mystery that still exercises leisurely minds. Odysseus, says the Odyssey, is shipwrecked on the island of Ogygia, a fairy land at Tahiti, whose goddess queen Calypso holds him as her lover for eight years, while secretly he pines for his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus, who pine for him at Ithaca. In Book One, Athena persuades Zeus to bid Calypso let Odysseus depart. The goddess flies to Telemachus and hears with sympathy the youth's simple tale, how the princes of Ithaca and its vassal isles are paying court to Penelope, seeking through her the throne, and how meanwhile they live gaily in Odysseus's palace and consume his substance. In Book Two, Telemachus bids the suitors disperse, but they laugh at his youth. Secretly, he embarks upon the sea in search of his father, while Penelope, mourning now for both husband and son, holds off the suitors by promising to wed one of them when she has completed her web, of which she unweaves at night as much as she has woven by day. In Book Three, Telemachus visits Nestor at Pylos, and in Book Four, Menelaus at Sparta, but neither can tell him where to find his father. The poet paints an attractive picture of Helen, settled and subdued, but still divinely beautiful. She has long since been forgiven her sins, and remarks that when Troy fell she had grown tired of the city anyway. In Book 5, now for the first time, Odysseus enters the tale. Sitting on the shore of Calypso's isle, his eyes were dry of tears, and his sweet life ebbed away as he longed mournfully for his return. By night, indeed, he would sleep by Calypso's side perforce in the hollow caves, unwilling beside the willing nymph, but by day he would sit on the rocks and the sands, rocking his soul with tears and groans, and looking over the unresting sea. Calypso, having detained him one more night, bids him make a raft and set out alone. In Book Six, after many struggles with the ocean, Odysseus lands in the mythical country of Phaeacia, possibly Corsaira Corfu, and is found by the maiden Nausicaa, who leads him to the palace of her father, King Alcinous. The lass falls in love with the strong-limbed, strong-hearted hero, and confides to her companions, Listen, my white-armed maidens, erewhile this man seemed to me uncomely, but now he is like the gods that keep wide heaven. Would that such a one might be called my husband, dwelling here, and that it might please him here to abide. In books seven and eight, Odysseus makes so good an impression that Alcinous offers him Nausicaa's hand. Odysseus excuses himself, but is glad to tell the story of his return from Troy. In Book 9, he tells the king that his ships were borne off their course to the land of the lotus eaters, who gave his men such honey-sweet lotus fruit that many forgot their homes and their longing, and Odysseus had to force them back to their ships. There they sailed to the land of the Cyclopes, one-eyed giants who lived without law or labor, 
on an island abounding in wild grain and fruit. Caught in a cave by the cyclop Polyphemus, who ate several of his men, Odysseus saved the remnant by lulling the monster to sleep with wine and then burning out his single eye. In Book Ten, the wanderers took again to the sea and came to the land of the Lestragonians, but these two were cannibals, and only Odysseus's ship escaped them. He and his mates reached the next isle of Aenea, where the lovely and treacherous goddess Circe lured most of them into her cave with song, drugged them, and turned them into swine. Odysseus was about to slay her when he changed his mind and accepted her love. He and his comrades, now restored to human form, remained with Circe a full year. In Book Eleven, setting sail again, they came to a land perpetually dark, which proved to be the entrance to Hades. There, Odysseus talked with the shades of Agamemnon, Achilles, and his mother. In Book Twelve, resuming their voyage, they passed the island of the Sirens, against whose seductive strains Odysseus protected his men by putting wax into their ears. In the Straits, Messina, of Scylla and Charybdis, his ship was wrecked, and he alone survived to live for eight long years on Calypso's isle. In Book Thirteen, Alcinous is so moved with sympathy by Odysseus's tale that he bids his men row Odysseus to Ithaca, but to blindfold him lest he learn and reveal the location of their happy land. On Ithaca, the goddess Athena guides the wanderer to the hut of his old swineherd Eumaeus, who, in Book Fourteen, though not recognizing him, receives him with gargantuan hospitality. In Book Fifteen, when Telemachus is led by the goddess to the same hut, Odysseus. In Book Sixteen, makes himself known to his son, and both wailed aloud vehemently. He unfolds to Telemachus a plan for slaying all the suitors. In Books Seventeen and Eighteen, in the guise of a beggar, he enters his palace, sees the wooers feasting at his expense, and rages inwardly when he hears that they lie with his maid servants at night, even while courting Penelope by day. In Books Nineteen and Twenty, he is insulted and injured by the suitors, but he defends himself with vigor and patience. In Book Twenty One, by this time the wooers have discovered the trick of Penelope's web and have forced her to finish it. She agrees to marry whichever of them can string Odysseus's great bow, which hangs on the wall, and shoot an arrow through the openings of twelve axes ranged in line. They all try and all fail. Odysseus asks for a chance and succeeds. In Book Twenty Two, then with a wrath that frightens everyone, he casts off his disguise, turns his arrows upon the suitors, and with the help of Telemachus. Eumaeus and Athena slays them all. In Book Twenty-Three, he finds it hard to convince Penelope that he is Odysseus. It is difficult to surrender twenty suitors for one husband. In Book Twenty-Four, he meets the attack of the suitors' sons, pacifies them, and re-establishes his kingdom. Meanwhile, in Argos, the greatest tragedy in Greek legend was pursuing its course. Orestes, son of Agamemnon, grown to manhood and aroused by his bitter sister Electra. Avenged their father by murdering their mother and her paramour. After many years of madness and wandering, Orestes ascended the throne of Argos Mycenae, circa 1176 B.C., and later added Sparta to his kingdom. But from his accession, the house of Pelops began to decline. Perhaps the decline had begun with Agamemnon, and that vacillating chieftain had used war as a means of uniting a realm that was already falling to pieces. But his victory completed his ruin. For few of his chieftains ever returned, and the kingdoms of many others had lost all loyalty to them. By the end of the age that had opened with the siege of Troy, the Achaean power was spent; the blood of Pelops was exhausted. The people waited patiently for a saner dynasty. Six, the Dorian conquest. About the year 1104 B.C., a new wave of immigration or invasion came down upon Greece from the restlessly expanding north. Through Illyria and Thessaly, across the Corinthian Gulf at Naupactus, and over the Isthmus at Corinth, a warlike people, tall, round-headed, letterless, slipped or marched or poured into the Peloponnesus, mastered it, and almost completely destroyed Mycenaean civilization. We guess at their origin and their root, but we know their character and their effect. They were still in the herding and hunting stage. Now and then they stopped to till the soil, but their main reliance was upon their cattle. Whose need for new pasturage kept the tribes ever on the move. One thing they had in unheard of quantity: iron. They were the emissaries of the Hallstatt culture to Greece. Hallstatt being a town in Austria whose iron remains have given its name to the first period of the Iron Age in Europe, and the hard metal of their swords and soles gave them a merciless supremacy over Achaeans and Cretans who still used bronze to kill. 
Probably from both west and east, from Elis and Megara, they came down upon the separate little kingdoms of the Peloponnesus, put the ruling classes to the sword, and turned the Mycenaean remnant into Helot serfs. Mycenaean tyrants went up in flames, and for some centuries Argos became the capital of Pelops' isle. On the Isthmus the invaders seized a commanding peak, the Acrocorinthus, and built around it the Dorian city of Corinth. The surviving Achaeans fled, some of them into the mountains of the northern Peloponnesus, some into Attica, some overseas to the islands and coasts of Asia. The conquerors followed them into Attica, but were repulsed. They followed them to Crete and made final the destruction of Knossos. They captured and colonized Milos, Thera, Kos, Nidus, and Rhodes. Throughout the Peloponnesus and Crete, where the Mycenaean culture had most flourished, the devastation was most complete. This terminal catastrophe in the prehistory of Aegean civilization is what modern historians know as the Dorian Conquest, and what Greek tradition called the Return of the Heraclidae. For the victors were not content to record their triumph as a conquest of a civilized people by barbarians. They protested that what had really happened was that the descendants of Heracles, resisted in their just re-entry into the Peloponnesus, had taken it by heroic force. We do not know how much of this is history and how much is diplomatic mythology designed to transform a bloody conquest into a divine right. It is difficult to believe that the Dorians were such excellent liars in the very youth of the world. Perhaps, as disputants will never allow, both stories were true. The Dorians were conquerors from the north, led by the scions of Heracles. Whatever the form of the conquest, its result was a long and bitter interruption in the development of Greece. Political order was disturbed for centuries. Every man, feeling unsafe, carried arms. Increasing violence disrupted agriculture and trade on land and commerce on the seas. War flourished, poverty deepened and spread. Life became unsettled as families wandered from country to country seeking security and peace. Hesiod called this the Age of Iron and mourned its debasement from the finer ages that had preceded it. Many Greeks believed that the discovery of iron had been to the hurt of man. The arts languished, painting was neglected, statuary contented itself with figurines, and pottery, forgetting the lively naturalism of Mycenaean Crete, degenerated into a lifeless geometrical style that dominated Greek ceramics for centuries. But not all was lost. Despite the resolution of the invading Dorians to keep their blood free from admixture with that of the subject population, despite the racial antipathies between Dorian and Ionian that were to incarnadine all Greece, there went on, rapidly outside of Laconia, slowly within, a mingling of the new stocks with the old, and perhaps the addition of the vigorous seed of Achaeans and Dorians with that of the more ancient and volatile peoples of southern Greece served as a powerful biological stimulant. The final result, after centuries of mingling, was a new and diverse people in whose blood Mediterranean, Alpine, Nordic, and Asiatic elements were disturbingly fused. Nor was Mycenaean culture entirely destroyed. Certain elements of the Aegean heritage, instrumentalities of social order and government, elements of craftsmanship and technology, modes and routes of trade, forms and objects of worship, ceramic and terutic skills, the art of fresco painting, decorative motives and architectural forms, maintained a half-stifled existence through centuries of violence and chaos. Cretan institutions, the Greeks believed, passed down into Sparta, and the Achaean assembly remained the essential structure of even democratic Greece. The Mycenaean Megaron probably provided the ground plan of the Doric temple, to which the Dorian spirit would add freedom, symmetry, and strength. The artistic tradition, slowly reviving, lifted Corinth, Sicyon, and Argos to an early renaissance, and made even doer Sparta, for a while, smile with art and song. It nourished lyric poetry through all this historyless dark age, it followed Pelasgian, Achaean, Ionian, Minian exiles in their flight emigration to the Aegean and Asia, and helped the colonial cities to leap ahead of their mother states in literature and art. And when the exiles came to the islands and Ionia, they found the remains of Aegean civilization ready to their hands. There, in old towns a little less disordered than on the continent, the Age of Bronze had kept something of its ancient craft and brilliance, and there on Asiatic soil would come the first reawakening of Greece. In the end, the contact of five cultures, Cretan, Mycenaean, Achaean, Dorian, Oriental, brought new youth to a civilization that had begun to die, that had grown coarse on the mainland through war and plunder, and effeminate in Crete through the luxury of its genius. 
The mixture of races and ways took centuries to win even a moderate stability, but it contributed to produce the unparalleled variety, flexibility, and subtlety of Greek thought and life. Instead of thinking of Greek culture as a flame that shone suddenly and miraculously amid a dark sea of barbarism, we must conceive of it as the slow and turbid creation of a people almost too richly endowed in blood and memories, and surrounded, challenged, and instructed by warlike hordes, powerful empires, and ancient civilizations. Book Two, The Rise of Greece, 1000 to 480 B.C. Chapter Four, Sparta, One, The Environment of Greece. Let us take an atlas of the classic world and find our way among the neighbors of ancient Greece. By Greece or Hellas, we shall mean all lands occupied in antiquity by peoples speaking Greek. We begin where many invaders entered, over the hills and through the valleys of Epirus. Here the ancestors of the Greeks must have tarried many a year, for they set up at Dodona a shrine to their thundering sky god Zeus. As late as the fifth century, the Greeks consulted the oracle there, and read the divine will in the clangor of cauldrons or the rustling leaves of the sacred oak. Through southern Epirus flowed the river Acheron, amid ravines so dark and deep that Greek poets spoke of it as the portal or very scene of hell. In Homer's day, the Epirates were largely Greek in speech and ways, but then new waves of barbarism came down upon them from the north and dissuaded them from civilization. Farther up the Adriatic lay Illyria, sparsely settled with untamed herdsmen who sold cattle and slaves for salt. On this coast, at Epidamnus, the Roman Dyrrachium, now Durazzo, Caesar disembarked his troops in pursuit of Pompey. Across the Adriatic, the expanding Greeks snatched the lower coasts from the native tribes and gave civilization to Italy. In the end, those native tribes would sweep back upon them, and one tribe, almost barbarous till Alexander's time, would swallow them up, along with their motherland in an unprecedented empire. Beyond the Alps ranged the Gauls, who were to prove very friendly to the Greek city of Messalia, or Marseille. At the western end of the Mediterranean lay Spain, already half-civilized and fully exploited by the Phoenicians and Carthaginians, when, about 550, the Greeks established their timid colony at Emporium, or Ampurias. On the coast of Africa, menacingly opposite Sicily, was Imperial Carthage, founded by Dido and the Phoenicians, tradition said, in 813. No mere village, but a city of 700,000 population, monopolizing the commerce of the western Mediterranean, dominating Utica, Hippo, and 300 other towns in Africa, and controlling prosperous lands, mines, and colonies in Sicily, Sardinia, and Spain. This fabulously wealthy metropolis was fated to lead the Oriental thrust against Greece in the west, as Persia would lead it in the east. Farther east on the African coast lay the prosperous Greek city of Cyrene, against a dark Libyan hinterland, then Egypt. It was the belief of most Greeks that many elements of their civilization had come to them from Egypt. Their legends ascribed the foundation of several Greek cities to men who, like Cadmus and Danaeus, had come from Egypt or had brought Egyptian culture to Greece by way of Phoenicia or Crete. Under the Sayide kings, 663 to 525, Egyptian commerce and art revived, and the ports of the Nile were for the first time opened to Greek trade. From the 7th century onward, many famous Greeks, Thales, Pythagoras, Solon, Plato, and Democritus may serve as examples, visited Egypt and were much impressed by the fullness and antiquity of its culture. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1.